The Saints find themselves 5-4 and four in the month of no- November after barely beating the Chicago Bears at home 24-17. to 17. Welcome back to the Two Dots Pod, everyone. I'm Kane Janish, and don't worry, this is this should be at least the final pod where I am not on camera. Just want to put that out there. But we got we got some stuff to talk about today as the Saints advance to 5 and 4 and get over 500 for the first time since they were 2 and 0 or 2 and 2, 2 and 1 whatever it was. It's been a while since the Saints had a winning record. It's nice to have a winning record. In the month of November they are playing meaningful football. In the month of November for the first time since 2020. It feels nice whether or not the team is playing good or not. They are 5 and 4 and they are in contention for the playoffs because this division is dog shit. So, Saints and Bears, the Saints could not find consistency on either offense or defense this week. A big question going into this game was can the offense be consistent and can the defense get off to a faster start? Can the offense get off to a faster, better start? And we got our answers. No. Overall, I thought things were good i think they were okay serviceable but i don't think that they were what they should have been they have a lot of things to fix it should not have been this close it most definitely should not have been this close they should have dominated this game after the third in the third quarter at the 241 mark the saints did not take a snap on their side of the field meaning every drive they had started on the bears side of the 50 yard line And I believe they only ended up getting like three points or like 10 points or something resulting from that. The Saints should have dominated this game. It was 24 to 17. It should have been 34 to 17, 31 to 17, 40 to 17. But it wasn't. And why was that? Before we get into defense, offense, and a few other things, here's a reminder. Saints are 5-4 and at the top of their division going into Minnesota next week. And then they will have a bye week. The Saints are 5 and 4, the Atlanta Falcons are 4 and 5, I believe. Tampa Bay is 3 and 5. Isaiah Foskey has a pulled quad, I believe is what they are believing his injury is, and Kendra Miller has an ankle injury. We do not know the extent to that injury, but we will keep you guys updated as we find out. So let's talk about the defense. And it was really a tale of two halves. They got off to a terrible start. They're letting Tyson I, I still don't know how to say his name. Tyson Bengay, Ben Benier, Ben I don't know. Ben Yat. I'm gonna say Tyson. They let this dude Tyson play like he was Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, and Josh Allen combined. Like one of your like creative player Madden quarterbacks. That's what he was looking like. He was throwing sidearm passes. He was running all over the field. The Saints couldn't do anything. The Bears were just tearing apart this defense. And I think a huge part of that was because they were playing a lot of zone. And the Saints typically, whenever they play a mobile quarterback, or not so much a mobile, but mobile and like a rookie, younger quarterback who's more inexperienced, they like to go into zone. That did not work. And not only did it not work, the defense hasn't been working for the the past few weeks in the first half. They have, I believe, like the worst or a bottom three defense in the first half over the past few weeks in terms of yards allowed, points allowed, rushing yards, and passing yards allowed. They've not been a good first half defense, but I'll give props to Dennis Allen. Second half, he has made some huge adjustments, and they've worked Texans game. They allowed three points in the second half. Jags game, I think they allowed seven, ten points in the second half. Last week against the Colts, um, I believe they allowed seven points points in the second half and this week they allowed three points in the second half so let's give dennis allen credit where credit is due he did a good job adjusting he's done a good job adjusting in the second half getting these guys in the right positions getting guys in the right plays getting himself a better doing a better job as a defensive coordinator and calling plays he did a good job now tail of first ha- tail of two halves first half they couldn't get pressure they couldn't stop the run. They couldn't stop the pass. The guys were wide open. Guys just couldn't win their one-on-one matchups and coverage. Aside from one man. And this one man, he honestly might... He's been the best player on this team the past two weeks. He was the best player on the field last week. And he was the best player on the field this week. Paulson Adebo saved the day. He was the only person basically 
consistently playing at a high level on the defense, aside from Carl Granderson, who balled out as well. But Paulson Adebo got that interception in the first half, set up a Saints touchdown. Later on, had another pick. Then he had a peanut punch, a Paulson punched forced fumble. Then recover that fumble. Paulson Adebo today had seven tackles, two interceptions, three passes defended, a forced fumble, and a fumble recovery. The only other player in NFL history to do that was Charles Woodson in 2009. Paulson Adebo right now is having a career season. A lot of people counted him out during the offseason when it was that cornerback two battle between him and Elante Taylor. A lot of people wanted to either like cut him, trade him, get value picks from him, bench him, whatever it was. And Paulson Adebo is just silencing everyone with this play. He's doing an outstanding job. Carl Granderson... He didn't have any sacks, but he was a force to be reckoned with in the running game. He was making plays, had that really nice big hit TFL. I believe he had another TFL in the game. That was a really nice job. I think he's probably been a top three, top five player for this team this season. And without him, this defense would probably be a lot, lot worse. First half analysis of this defense is that, is that it was just bad. There is not really much else to talk about other than it was bad. They were just getting beat up they couldn't tackle they couldn't get pressure they couldn't get off the field on third downs the only way they got off the field was with turnovers and they were just struggling really to do anything uh, they should have went to more main coverage i believe that's what they went to later on in the second half da adjusted and got them in the right positions and all this called the right plays so props to them let's talk about the second half defense they allowed 114 yards in the second half I believe it was like 63 rushing yards and 51 passing yards. Props to the defense. But but 63 rushing yards. The Bears, I believe, had 163 total rushing yards. This run defense is bad. And there's some scenarios. There's been scenarios with this team in the past four where the pass rush sucks, but the run defense is good. Or the run defense sucks, but the pass rush is good. Either or, like it's like pick your poison. Which one would you rather have? The Saints have neither. Let's just be real. They do not have a good pass rush for the most part. Cam Jordan, he may not be who he was, but he's still getting double teamed and triple teamed at times. You have guys on the interior who are occasionally winning, but they're mainly there to stop the run. And then you have Carl Granderson, who he's definitely winning a lot more than anyone else would be, but he's still not winning, I think, enough. And I know that's a lot of pressure to put on him because they don't have anyone else to rotate. Isaiah Foskey's injured, but he hasn't been really doing anything. Peyton Turner is injured. They don't really have anyone else to rotate in there as an edge rusher. So these guys are playing a lot more than they probably should. And it's typical for teams to rotate defensive ends. But the Saints, and the Saints especially, like to rotate their defensive ends. But they haven't been able to because they, there is just absolutely no depth at that position. So, run defense is a major red flag. It was a red flag last week after the Colts game. I thought maybe they were they had a solid running game. It was just like a few runs broke out. But after this game, this is brutal. And now they're going to play the Vikings next week, who Josh Dobbs is a very mobile quarterback. Saints are like the worst team in the NFL at stopping mobile quarterbacks. That's like the kryptonite to Dennis Allen's defense defensive ends can't keep contained they don't have the linebackers or, or the speed at the linebacker front seven position to really keep up with these speedy quarterbacks and the saints are just they might be screwed next week when they play joshua dobbs i mean they let tyson baggett beignet i'm just call him tyson beignet tyson beignet to run all over them he had like 70 rushing yards i didn't know that dude can move like that so saints got to figure something out there defensively because next week they're going to get killed we still don't know if justin jefferson will be back but we will keep an eye on that now let's flip over to the offense which just like the defense was a tale of two halves i thought in the first half the offense was good i thought they started off good i didn't like the opening drive per se but i did like that they made a conscious effort to get the ball to Chris Olave early and often. They threw to him, I believe, two or three times on the opening drive. Then the next drive, they went right back to him. Then when they got the ball in the red zone, they got the ball to him. Like They wanted to get more involved, and that's good. This offense is better when this dude is involved, when he's at his best, because, well, he has the talent to be a top 10 wide receiver in the NFL. The problem with him 
and he said of himself this past month he was in a slump the problem with him is his mental if he doesn't feel like he's getting targets or receptions enough he gets in his head and when an opportunity presents presents itself then it slips away or other times when he's frustrated he can maybe have poor uh body um what am i what's the word i'm thinking of body i don't know what to say but i think you guys know what i'm trying to say um also like bad attitude route running and effort was an issue for like two weeks so i think a lot of that was in his head and then he had the arrest so i think it was very important for the saints to get him involved he didn't have any like breakout game or anything but he had a t really nice touchdown catch he had some really nice plays i think he had like five six receptions for 46 yards that's a decent stat line with a touchdown so i think it was very good that they tried to get him involved because they need him to be involved but outside of that no one on this offense really had a big game which is not surprising but it is also a little surprising i would say probably the person who had the big game was juan johnson and if you go back to our preview pod of this game we were saying how juan johnson might not have like a hundred yards but the tied but tight ends against the bears typically have success and we were saying how juan might have a stat line of like five receptions 50 yards and a touchdown i believe his stat final stat line was like five receptions 30 yards and a touchdown so there's a little like you know we, we get a little predictable or we like to um we, we know what we're doing here at this who that's pod so overall though no one really had a huge game no one running wise receiving wise i would say probably the person who had the best game offensively was Taysom Hill Taysom Hill had a really good game um so I, I guess Taysom and Juwan probably had the best games offensively Chris Olave is probably like a level below them or kind of like in that same conversation but no one really stood out to me but in the first half overall in the offense I thought they did a good job spreading the ball around getting guys involved moving the football offensive line looked really good in pass protection they were giving Derek Carr time Derek Carr has only been sacked two times in the past three games that is a very good stat line. If you would have told us that back in week three, weeks one through three, we would have said, fuck you. Why are you messing with my emotions? Now we're here. The offensive line looked solid. I wouldn't say it was great or like good. I'd say it was in between above average and good. Andres P at left tackle and James Hurst at left guard was solid. And it seems like it's working. Trevor Penning, they had him in, I think, on a few plays to just get him reps. He's still off learning and trying to figure out like his identity not only as like a player but just as a left tackle in an nfl player so he's off learning trying to figure out learn get a different perspective of how to play th the football game and i think it's good that andres pete is playing solid because now he can look at what andres pete is doing what is he doing so well that i'm not is it his footwork is it the way he's placing his hands is it his dropbacks or whatever it may be i will say however the offensive line is not good in the running game Whenever they are not running the football with Taysom Hill, this team can't run the football. They had, I think if you took away all the Taysom Hill runs, they had like 13 carries for like 36 yards or 33 yards or something like, like 30 yards basically on 13 carries, including a 13 yard Alvin Kamara run. And if you took that away, it would be like 22 yards on 13 carries. This run blocking offensive line is not good. Now they did play a top three rushing defense. But you got to be able to run the football. They couldn't run the football to close out games they, or to close out this game. They had to rely on Taysom Hill and throwing the football to try and seal out the game. And it just didn't work. Work. But overall, first half, offense looked very effective. I thought it was going to be another week where, and I never thought I would say this, where the defense would have to help out the offense and bail them out and let the offense or have the defense help with the offense because the offense was bailing them out. I thought they were going to have to score 30 plus points. And then in the second half, the defense flipped a switch and, and so did the offense. Offense only scored 10 points on five takeaways for the Saints today. So the Pulse and Adebo interception, the first one led to a touchdown. Then the Pulse and Adebo fumble led to a field goal. Then I believe... The next turnover was the Marcus May pick that led to a turnover on downs, which we will talk about in just a second. Then another Pulse and Adebo pick led to a punt. And then the final forced fumble led to end of game. So I guess that final one doesn't really count. 
But the Saints need to execute off of opportunities. Yes, I think they played good. And all we really ask for this offense, really, like, is to score 21 or more points. And for the most part, if you can do that, chances are they probably win because of this defense. But as of recently, maybe now they need to score more because this defense can't get off to fast starts and get off to good starts. But we, at the beginning of the year, all we asked was for this offense to score 21 or more points. They scored 24 today. And I, in my opinion, they need to do a lot better. There's a lot of missed opportunities. But they did their job for the most part. Now we will talk about why the offense probably sucked in the second half. I think the play calling went from trying to score points. And when this defense started doing their thing, it went from trying to score points to trying to take away time, trying to run up the clock, well, basically same thing, and get, let the defense rest. Kind of playing conservative and not to lose as opposed to playing to win. And I have mixed feelings about Pete Carmichael in this game. I thought he had good moments and he had bad moments. Let's talk about the bad moments because those glare more than the good moments. But the good moments include basically the first half, getting Olave involved, getting Taysom Hill involved. But the bad moment, and this one is glaring, fourth and one, and you run a QB sneak with Derek Carr instead of running QB sneak with Taysom Hill, QB power with Taysom Hill, handing it off to Jamal Williams. Whenever you are in third and one or fourth and one, those are the three plays that you should be running. Unless it is like 30 seconds left from midfield and you got to throw a Hail Mary or some, something like that. There is no scenario where I would want you running QB sneak with Derek Carr instead of Taysom Hill or Taysom Hill QB power or handing it off to Jamal Williams. I get the thinking of it. They went kind of like no huddle. They kind of went, wanted to hike it fast, maybe catch him off guard or whatever, and it didn't work. I will say this. Pete Carmichael did a good job around the fourth quarter on that touchdown drive of getting the offense in tempo. They kind of went no huddle a little bit. They didn't go no huddle fully, but they went. They ran a play, ran no huddle, got the first down. Then they called a play, went no huddle, ran that play, and then they went back in the huddle. So he did a good job of getting them into tempo. But was this because tempo works for them, or was it because that is desperation? They needed to have a touchdown. We'll never know. But I, I want to give him props where props is deserved. That was good. I feel like there's a mixed bag between both Dennis Allen and Pete Carmichael in this game. There's both signs of good and bad. So that's what we're going to be talking. Well, that's what we talked about it. And one, some other things I want to talk about. Colin Saunders. This man should have caught a touchdown, but guess what? Him being on the field allowed Juwan Johnson to get that wide open. He was double teamed, and it looked like the guy who was supposed to cover Juwan Johnson was more focused on Saunders than he was on Juwan Johnson, which opened up the play and resulted in a touchdown. I want to see Saunders score a touchdown, whether it's a run or a pass, whatever it is, I want to see it. He's in the ultimate decoy and the ultimate blocker. When he's on the field, you're okay. He's either blocking. And when they're throwing it, all your attention is going to him because why would you have a defensive lineman on the field? If all your attention is on one guy, chances are someone else is going to be open. And we saw that on that play to Juwan Johnson. Taysom Hill with that nice touchdown pass. It was awesome. And the second thing, probably the final thing that I want to talk about with this offense. Yes, they won. Yes, this probably doesn't matter, but it matters a little bit. They got to get Michael Thomas involved because you got to. Chris Olave had that really bad drop on third down and three. I'm not trying to take away anything from the good game he had, but if it's third down and three, I want... And Chris Olave ran like a hitch slant kind of route over the middle of the field. I would rather Michael Thomas run that route than Chris Olave. You, you got to get Michael Thomas involved. He had one target on the day. I don't know if that's a scheme issue. I don't know if that's Derek Carr not throwing him the ball or if it's both or if it's neither. Maybe Michael Thomas just wasn't getting open, but they got to get him involved. You have to get everyone involved. Even when Michael Thomas was getting the ball consistently the past few weeks I was saying if I want to get Chris Olave involved because this is a better team and the better offense when he's getting the football same thing here yeah you got Chris Olave involved you got Rashid Shahid involved a little bit you got Juwan Johnson involved a little bit I think they did a better job of throwing passes over the middle but guess what you're not throwing passes over the middle to your best over the middle 
intermediate weapon, which is Michael Thomas. Get him on some slants. You made an effort to get Chris Olave the ball early. Make an effort to get Michael Thomas the ball early. Get a, His slant route is probably a good drive starter. Get him involved on some of those. And Michael Thomas didn't care. Michael Thomas only cares about winning. I don't know if any of you guys saw the post-game speech from him. But he was like, just continue to stack these wins. Let's go and build upon this. It wasn't, he didn't, doesn't seem like there's bad blood. I know he's probably a little frustrated that he didn't have a catch because I know that stuff matters to him. But I know all he cares about is winning. And in the past, when he's a, quote unquote been a diva, it's because the team lost and he felt like he didn't do enough. Not because I got five targets instead of 10, that kind of thing. They got to get him more involved. Michael Thomas is a team player. He's a team leader. They got to get him more involved though. Like, he's been the most consistent player on the team. Just get him a little bit more involved. Or just get him, make an effort to get him the football consistently. Now, let's talk about the special teams. Let's start off with the good here. I thought Lou Headley had one of his better days as a Saint today. He had some pretty nice punts. Um, nothing really glaring. I know he had like a 42-yard punt and a 44-yard punt. And that second one was saved by Isaac Yedem, who made an outstanding standing play as a Giedem should be like a second team all pro gunner my goodness that was an amazing play but overall i thought lou headley had a better game i know he's been getting including for me because man it's been frustrating to watch him play he's been getting a lot of criticism which has been deserved but i think he had a solid okay game today had some decent hang time and i think he had some decent yardage on these punts they weren't the, where they should be but i thought it was better and i just want to say i think that was decent to see him kind of improve a little bit as he had that really nice play now blake groupie let's talk about blake groupie this is probably a pretty hot topic and i'm sure it's one that a lot of people want to discuss blake groupie went one of two made a 55 yarder and missed a very crucial 47 yarder here's my take on blake groupie I think he, he is a very talented kicker. I think he has the leg and the confidence to be a very good NFL kicker. That 55-yarder, he made it look like it might have been able to go through at like 58, 59, um, depending on like the accuracy and like if you move back four yards, does it hit the upright? The issue with the groupie, and this is a big issue, the kicks we need him to make are the ones he's not making. The Packers game, yeah, he missed it, but in my opinion, that game fell over before he even missed it, and the Packers still had a minute and two timeouts, and the way that game was going, it did not feel like the Saints were ever going to stop that offense, but that is a kick he should be making. Then he missed two against the Texans. He missed a 50, what, four? I'm okay if he misses a 54-yarder. He took that one out, and then he misses a 27-yarder. That's the one you have to make. Then he missed one against Jacksonville. It didn't cost the team really the win, but it was a 51, 52-yarder kick. That's one you got to make. Or he has the leg and the talent, in my opinion, to be making that. He just needs to be better, more consistent. So he missed a crucial 47-yard kick today, hit the left upright. And it seems like on all his kicks, he tends to, his kicks tend to lean left lean towards the left goal post um at least as of recent i don't know if anyone else has seen that or um thinks that but in my opinion i think he's been kind of kicking left a little bit but man blake groupie should a lot of people are going to be wondering should the saints consider signing a kicker i looked at the free agent kickers and there's really only two guys on the list who i would really consider and it is um robbie gold in Mason Crosby, but those guys, one of those is guys is 40 years old and one of them is 36. So the issue, in my opinion, if you sign one of those guys is now the kick power isn't there. Maybe the situational clutch gene is there, but not the kick power. And with this offense, once they tend to have issues, like kind of getting past the 40-yard line or a 30-yard line or whatever, and they kind of kick longer field goals. Blake Groupie's leg has kind of helped out the team so far. And I know Blake Groupie's getting a lot of shit for the games that he's, like, fucked up and has costed the Saints wins. 
but he's also helped this team win football games. Week one, if he misses a kick, they lose. Week two, if he misses a kick, they lose. Uh, Packers game, Bucks game, uh, Patriots game. So, yeah, he there's been good and bad from him. And I went back and looked at Will Lutz's first nine games and compared them to Blake Groupie's first nine games. So Will Lutz on extra points was 29 of 30 his rookie season in the first nine weeks. Blake Rupi is 19 of 19. On field goal kicks, Will Lutz went 14 of 19 on field goals. That's 73.7%. Blake Rupi is 18 of 23 on field goals. That's 78.2%. So a little bit better than Will Lutz his rookie season. And Will Lutz had an, a pretty big issue his rookie season of kicking balls low. He was more prone to blocked kicks. And that was an issue. But the Saints stuck out with him. They saw the talent there and it ended up working out for them because Will Lutz ended up being a top 10 kicker for four years and then kind of started dropping a little bit. And I think a lot of people forget a lot of the kicks Will Lutz actually missed because of either Drew Brees saved him like the next drive or came back or the defense bailed him out. Or the Saints lost in such a fashionable, unbelievable way, we completely forgot about it. I actually go back through a lot of the previous Saints games, like going back to like 2010 or whatever, just kind of looking through stats, highlights, and all that. Will Lutz had a missed kick in the Saints and Eagles divisional game in 18. Got bailed out by a Marshawn pick. I believe he had a missed field goal in the Minneapolis Miracle game. But we forget about it because of the Stefan Diggs play. He had a missed kick in the Saints and Vikings wildcard game in 2020, 2019. But we forget about it because we want to forget about that game at all costs. There's a lot of kicks that Will Lutz missed, but we just forget about it because other events transpired and those overtake the kicks Will Lutz missed. Now, I'm not trying to shit on Will Lutz. He did a lot more good than he did bad for the Saints, but I'm saying Will Lutz wasn't He's not a top 10 kicker in the NFL right now. He's probably not going to be that for the rest of his career. He's he's probably a top 20 kicker, probably around the 17-ish range. Last season, he was not very good. That's just the truth to it. So I'm not trying to defend Blake Groupie. He needs to be better. He needs to figure out what the issue is with these kicks and clutch and very important situations. But I'm not ready to give up on him. Maybe bring in a veteran to kind of help him through these situations or kind of, I don't know if kicker mentors are a thing, but surely it couldn't hurt to bring it Robbie Gold in to kind of see um, if he can help out Blake Groupie in these certain situational kicks. Speaking of situational, let's talk about the Saints in situational plays. On third downs, I believe in the first half, they went six of seven. Really good on third down. Really, really good. And then... In the second half, they did a lot worse, and they ended up being 7 of 14 on third downs. And I think that has to do with conservative play calling, kind of playing and calling plays not to win as opposed to trying to win, or trying not to lose as opposed to trying to win. That's what I was trying to say. And that led to the third down offense kind of slumping a little bit more than it actually was showing signs of doing. They went over one on fourth down. We already went over that. They should have Taysom Hill in on that fourth and one play situational awareness dennis allen that accepted penalty that led to a touchdown was atrocious third and two they get a stop they get a holding and he accepted the penalty he took third and 12 over fourth and two gave the bears another chance to get a first down and they ended up getting it and it resulted in a touchdown when they probably could have kicked a field goal dennis allen explained after the game that his thinking behind that was he thought they were going to go for it, get them back a little bit, get a stop, and force them to take a field goal or maybe get a turnover. I understand that, but if you don't trust your defense to get a stop on fourth and two, maybe you have an issue. Maybe there's an issue right there. So DA needs to be better as a situational awareness head coach. It just kind of seems like sometimes he just... I don't know, becomes a deer in headlights and just kind of blanks out and doesn't realize what what's going on. Obviously, I can't be criticizing an NFL head coach. I'm currently sitting on my couch talking into a microphone, and he knows more than I will ever know in terms of football. But it just feels like you should have taken the penalty there, relied on your defense, and if they get it, whatever. 
or they'll kick a field goal. Cool. Now, offensively, they went 3-5 in the red zone. That's improvement. One of them was a missed kick from Blake Rupi, and the other one was the end of the game. So they really went 3 of 4. That's improvement. I thought the red zone was better. Derek Carr made a really nice pass to Olave, stayed in the pocket in the red zone. They needed that. The Saints last week relied on the running game and the running backs and Taysom Hill to score in the red zone. This week it didn't work. They let Derek Carr throw the football, and it worked. They got Taysom Hill and Chris Olave on touchdowns. And then what was the third one? Oh, Taysom Hill to throw a touchdown to Juwan Johnson. So all three of their touchdowns, all three of their touchdown scoring red zone trips were all passing. I think that's a sign of promise or hope, I should say. I don't think the issue is fixed yet. We need to see it more consistently. But I think it's a sign of promise and a sign of maybe things getting better. I will say this. One penalty for the Saints. One penalty. That's improvement. You got to see it next week. You got to be better consistently. But that is improvement right there. If you would have told us before the game that the Saints had five turnovers and one penalty, we would have said the score is 34-0, not 24-17. So take that as you will. You got to take the wins when you take when you have the wins. I'm not going to complain about getting a win and being competitive in the month of November. Last year in November, it was terrible. We knew that we weren't doing shit. Two years ago, Jameis was injured. We knew we weren't doing shit with Trevor Simeon in the month of November. So... It's nice to be 5-4 and four, sitting at the top of the division, whether or not this team has looked good or bad. You're at the top of the division with a winning record. You got to take them when you can. Now, for the final segment or for the final uh, topic of the episode, proper drop, if you don't know what that is, we're going to give props to a few players and then we're going to drop a few players of like, okay, these guys were probably the 10th best player on the team now they're the 15th or whatever similar to like three up or three down just proper drop so props paulson adibo paulson adibo and paulson adibo and uh paulson adibo oh my goodness this dude is having a career year two picks and a forced fumble paulson adibo single-handedly saved the football game paulson adibo Adibo, we already talked about how good he was playing earlier but man paulson adibo is a baller and this kind of goes hand in hand a little bit, but Paulson Adebo cannot make the plays he's been making unless Marshawn Lattimore is covering his half of the field. Like Paulson Adebo has four picks, Marshawn has one. Paulson Adebo has been making more plays than Marshawn Lattimore, but you want to know why? No one is throwing on Marshawn Lattimore's side. So if you can't throw to one side of the field, then you're throwing to Alante Taylor or Paulson Adebo, and Adebo's just been taking advantage of that and making plays so props to Adebo and also a little bit of props to Marshawn Lattimore because Adebo can't be he wouldn't be making these plays unless Lattimore was doing his job number two Taysom Hill this one's obvious Taysom Hill ran he's the only effective part of this rushing offense he caught a touchdown threw a touchdown went through his reads it was awesome to see he's just he's probably like the most valuable player on offense right now or he's at least been the most productive and best offensive player in my opinion and the final guy Juwan Johnson he didn't have like a hundred yard game he didn't have like the incredible one-handed catch but I thought it was awesome to see him get involved they got passes to him over the middle Derek Carr went 12 of 12 on passes like in breaking middle-ish routes courtesy of Nick Underhill of New Orleans that football John Johnson Props to him, caught a touchdown, got the tight ends involved, had a tight end, Taysom Hill, third a tight end, John Johnson for a touchdown. Just wanted to give props to him. Drop. Blake Groupie, we already talked about this for an extended period of time, but he needs to be better, and we'll have to see. One of these times, he's going to cost them the game, or he's going to save them the game. He's already costed them, I guess you could say, the Packers game, and he probably had a bit, he had a big impact packed on the Texans game. Number two, run defense, atrocious, 150, 160 yards for the Bears after a very bad performance against the Colts last week, atrocious, they got to fix this run defense, I don't know what it's going to take, I don't know if it will be fixed this season, I don't know if it will be fixed next season, but they got to be better, I don't know if that has to do with aging or scheme, something has to give. 
And the final thing is the first half defense, which we already covered. But that is just, they got to fix that. It's got to go off to better start. It's got to create turnovers in the first half. And next week will be a tough challenge. You're on the road in Minnesota, who is five and four. They have a mobile quarterback. They might be getting Justin Jefferson back. They have a really good coach. They have things to prove. We'll have to see how that game ends up. And we'll have that game covered for you guys all throughout the week. And until then, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. If you guys want to follow me on Instagram or Twitter, just check out the screen or click any links in the description. And I'll see you guys for the next video when we'll be talking about the Saints. Mm -hmm.